Appendix B for the Essay on the Creative Imagination. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Essay on the Creative Imagination by Theodule Ribot. Appendix B. On the Nature of the Unconscious Factor. We have seen that in the question of the unconscious there must be recognized a positive part, facts, and a hypothetical part, theories. See Part 1, Chapter 3. In so far as the facts are concerned, it would be well, I think, to establish two categories. One, static unconscious, comprising habits, memory, and, in general, all that is organized knowledge. It is a state of preservation, of rest, very relatively, since representations suffer incessant corrosion and change. Two, dynamic unconscious, which is a state of latent activity, of elaboration and incubation. We might give a multitude of proofs of this unconscious rumination. The well-known fact that an intellectual work gains by being interrupted, that in resuming it one often finds it cleared up, changed, even accomplished, was explained by some psychologists prior to Carpenter by the resting of the mind. It would be just as valid to say that a traveler covers leagues by lying abed. The author just named has brought together many observations in which the solution of a mathematical, mechanical, commercial problem appeared suddenly after hours and days of vague, undefinable uneasiness, the cause of which is unknown, which, however, is only the result of an underlying cerebral working, for the trouble, sometimes rising to anguish, ceases as soon as the unawaited conclusion has entered consciousness. The men who think the most are not those who have the clearest and most conscious ideas, but those having at their disposal a rich fund of unconscious elaboration. On the other hand, shallow minds have a naturally poor unconscious fund, capable of but slight development. They give out immediately and rapidly all that they are able to give. They have no reserve. It is useless to allow them time for reflection or invention. They will not do better. They may do worse. As to the nature of the unconscious working, we find disagreement and darkness. One may doubtless maintain, theoretically, that in the inventor everything goes on in subconsciousness and in unconsciousness, just as in consciousness itself, with the exception that a message does not arrive as far as the self, that the labor that may be followed, in clear consciousness, in its progress and retreats, remains the same when it continues unknown to us. This is possible, yet it must at least be recognized that consciousness is rigorously subject to the condition of time. The unconscious is not. This difference, not to mention others, is not negligible, and could well arouse other problems. The contemporary theories regarding the nature of the unconscious seem to me reducible to two principal positions, one psychological, the other physiological. 1. The physiological theory is simple and scarcely permits any variations. According to it, unconscious activity is simply cerebral. It is an unconscious cerebration. The psychic factor, which ordinarily accompanies the activity of the nervous centers, is absent. Although I incline toward this hypothesis, I confess that it is full of difficulties. It has been proven through numerous experiments, Ferre, Binet, Mosso, Janet, Newbold, etc., that unconscious sensations act since they produce the same reactions as conscious sensations, and Mosso has been able to maintain that the testimony of consciousness is less certain than that of the sphygmograph. But the particular instance of invention is very different, for it does not merely suppose the adaptation to an end which the physiological factor would suffice to explain. It implies a series of adaptations, corrections, rational operations, of which nervous activity alone furnishes us no example. 2. The psychological theory is based on an equivocal use of the word consciousness. Consciousness has one definite mark. It is an internal event existing, not by itself, but for me, and in so far as it is known by me. But the psychological theory of the unconscious assumes that if we descend from clear consciousness progressively to obscure consciousness, to the subconscious, to the unconscious that manifests itself only through its motor reactions, the first state thus successively impoverished still remains, down to its final term, identical in its basis with consciousness. It is an hypothesis that nothing justifies. No difficulty arises when we bear in mind the legitimate distinction between consciousness of self and consciousness in general, the former entirely subjective, the latter in a way objective, the consciousness of a man captivated by an attractive scene, better yet, the fluid form of reverie or of the awakening from syncope. 
we may admit that this evanescent consciousness effective in nature felt rather than perceived is due to a lack of synthesis of relations among the internal states which remain isolated unable to unite into a whole the difficulty commences when we descend into the region of the subconscious which allows stages whose obscurity increases in proportion as we move away from clear consciousness like a lake in which the action of light is always nearing extinction in double coexisting personalities automatic writing mediums etc here some postulate two currents of consciousness existing at the same time in one person without reciprocal connection others suppose a field of consciousness with a brilliant center and extending indefinitely toward the dim distance still others liken the phenomenon to the movement of waves whose summit alone is lighted up indeed the authors declare that with these comparisons and metaphors they make no pretense of explaining but certainly they all reduce unconsciousness to consciousness as a special to a general case and what is that if not explaining i do not intend to enumerate all the varieties of the psychological theory the most systematic that of myers accepted by delboeuf and others is full of a biological mysticism all its own here it is in substance in every one of us there is a conscious self adapted to the needs of life and potential selves constituting the subliminal consciousness the latter much broader in scope than personal consciousness has dependent on it the mere vegetative life circulation trophic actions etc ordinarily the conscious self is on the highest level the subliminal consciousness on the second but in certain extraordinary states hypnosis hysteria divided consciousness etc it is just the reverse here is the bold part of the hypothesis its author suppose that the supremacy of the subliminal consciousness is a reversion a return to the ancestral in the higher animals and in primitive man according to them all trophic actions entered consciousness and were regulated by it in the course of evolution this became organized the higher consciousness has delegated to the subliminal consciousness the care of silently governing the vegetative life but in case of mental disintegration there occurs a return to the primitive state in this manner they explain burns through suggestion stigmata trophic changes of a miraculous appearance etc it is needless to dwell on this conception of the unconscious it has been vehemently criticized notably by bramwell who remarks that if certain faculties could little by little fall into the domain of subliminal consciousness because they were no longer necessary for the struggle for life there are nevertheless faculties so essential to the well-being of the individual that we ask ourselves how they have been able to escape from the control of the will if for example some lower type had the power of arresting pain how could it lose it at the foundation of the psychological theory in all its forms is the unexpressed hypothesis that consciousness may be likened to a quantity that forever decreases without reaching zero this is a postulate that nothing justifies the experiments of psychophysicists without solving the question would support rather the opposite view we know that the threshold of consciousness or minimum perceptible quantity appears and disappears suddenly the excitation is not felt under a determinate limit likewise in regard to the summit of perception or maximum perceptible any increase in excitation is no longer felt if above a determinate limit moreover in order that an increase or diminution be felt between these two extreme limits it is necessary that both have a constant relation differential threshold as is expressed in weber's law all these facts and others that i omit are not favorable to the thesis of growing or diminishing continuity of consciousness it has even been maintained that consciousness has an aversion for continuity to sum up the two rival theories are equally unable to penetrate into the inner nature of the unconscious factor we have thus had to limit ourselves to taking it as a fact of experience and to assign it its place in the complex function that produces invention the observations of flournoy in his book mentioned above part one chapter three have a particular interest in relation to our subject his medium helene s very unlike others who are satisfied with forecasts of the future discloses of past events counsel prognosis evocation etc without creating anything in the proper sense is the author of three or four novels one of which at least is invented out of whole cloth revelations in regard to the planet mars its countries inhabitants dwellings etc although the descriptions and pictures of helene s are found on comparison to be borrowed from our terrestrial globe and transposed and changed as flournoy has well shown it is certain that in this martian novel 
to say nothing of the others, there is a richness of invention that is rare among mediums. The creative imagination in its subliminal, unconscious form encloses the other in its éclat. We know how much the cases of mediums teach us in regard to the unconscious life of the mind. Here we are permitted, as an exceptional case, to penetrate into the dark laboratory of romantic invention, and we can appreciate the importance of the labor that is going on there. End of Appendix B